Hello, I'm Mary Hammond Bernson. I'm the director of the East Asia Resource Center at the University of Washington. And I'm a national co-founder and co-director of the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. I started my career as a high school social studies teacher who taught about Asia at every chance I could get. Today in this talk, I'm going to use one painting by one artist, Sashu Toyo, to explore ways to look at art from a social studies perspective. I love looking at art, and when I do that, it's usually for emotional reasons. It's because I enjoy it, or I can marvel at the beauty, or be in awe of an artist's talent. I find art can be eye-opening or thought-provoking, forces me to think about contemporary social issues. Art can give us pleasure, or it can make us uncomfortable. It inspires us to ask questions. From a social studies perspective, art can also be useful. Art objects are primary sources. Art can be the subject of analysis, and some forms of analysis develop skills that we try to teach in social studies. Looking at art can help us step outside our time and place to glimpse other worlds and other ways of being. As a teacher, you may be thinking, nice, but who has time for looking at art? My curriculum is overloaded. There's too much to cover. Tests rule, and this isn't being tested. My classroom equipment keeps breaking down. And on top of that, I don't have any time myself to learn about art. My goal is to persuade you that it's worthwhile to overcome those hurdles and pause to look deeply at a work of art in a social studies class. It isn't a detour. It's another path toward your goals as a social studies educator. This talk is part of a series of talks about different ways educators can use a work of art. In another talk, art historian Carla Stansifer introduced the Japanese artist Sashu Toyo and showed you some of his most famous paintings, like this one. She used this winter landscape, painted in 1486, to demonstrate the process of formal analysis, one of the methods art historians use. It analyzes seven elements, such as line, shape, and color. We'll look at the same picture by Sashitoyo, using methods that tie to the skills and knowledge that appear in social studies curriculum and standards. I'll quickly introduce four popular questioning techniques, and afterwards I'll fill in some background information about the artist and his time period. At the end of this talk, you'll find a link to a resource page that provides more information. In looking at the questions I'm going to show you, envision how you would use them to meet your social studies goals. We'll start with VTS visual thinking strategies. In this method, the teacher uses three open-ended questions over and over. The teacher may paraphrase student responses, but not, not supposed to say anything like, that's a great observation. Here are the questions. What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can we find? So let's look at the picture. Those questions may seem deceptively simple or simply frustrating to you or to the students, but following the sequence leads to really positive results. The question, what's going on in this picture? When a student answers that, the student is the expert about his or her own observations and opinions. There are no right or wrong answers. As a result, this method is inclusive and empowering. The different kinds of learners in your classroom gain an entry point into the discussion. The next question is, what do you see that makes you say that? The second step requires students to slow down and find evidence to support their initial observation. But there's no wrong answer here either. If a student points to the vertical line in the middle of this picture, 
and says she sees a mountain with a cell tower on top and then supports that observation with a statement about little crossbars or a tower and wires coming down. What she sees, that is what she sees. And she's explained why it is that she perceives that. The third question prods further. What more can we find? Here we're looking at a close-up of the bottom of that picture. Eventually, different observations emerge from the class. Another student might say, I see a boat there, or a little person, some kind of building. Somebody might go back to the earlier statement and say, that's not a cell tower up there on that mountain, and support that opinion. In the process of answering three simple questions, students are practicing skills important in the social studies, observing, making inferences, backing up their ideas with evidence, listening to and considering the views of others, and discussing different interpretations of a source. And you, as the teacher, can make all this happen without needing to be an art history expert yourself. You aren't telling your students all about a picture. You're empowering them to observe and explore it. That's the core of the VTS method. Presented way too quickly, I'm afraid to do justice to it. I encourage you to explore it further by following the link at the end of this talk. Now, at this point, you may wonder, Am I, as a social studies educator, supposed to let students keep thinking they are seeing cell towers here? When we use these questions, the students don't learn the identity of the object. Who painted it? When? Where? For what audience? They're gaining skills, but not specific knowledge. Not yet. A similar strategy to VTS is see, think, wonder. This is a thinking routine that asks three questions again. What do you see here on the right? What do you think about that? What does it make you wonder? This strategy is different in subtle ways. And that third question, can be used to prompt students to form their own questions and hypotheses that will be researched throughout a unit. What does it make you wonder? That question can yield student questions that genuinely interest them. A third strategy, one often used in art history and criticism, is the Feldman four-step method. There are variations on it, but uh, here's one on the screen. This starts the same way as the others, but then goes in somewhat different directions that employs some higher level thinking skills. What do you see? There's description again. What elements of art are at work in the piece? This is the, the process of formal analysis as Carla Stancifer showed you in a different talk in the same series. So what the elements of work, what elements are they, are lines, color, texture, others like that. What is the purpose or meaning of the work? Now that's interpretation. And for that, you will need in additional information. Finally, what do you think about the artwork? That's judgment and evaluation. Finally, one last strategy here. This fourth one is the classic source analysis tool from the Library of Congress. This method looks at the work of art as a primary source. It's a piece of evidence in the form of a picture rather than in written words. It can be studied and analyzed. These questions were designed for photographs and prints, but apply well to works of art too. They're grouped under three headings, observe, reflect, and question. So back to our picture. Whatever, me whatever method you've used, you've slowed down the pace of your class to practice looking carefully at art. Now you can head in many different directions that reinforce what they've been doing in class, forming hypotheses, gathering information to support them, analyzing that information, 
presenting that information to each other, working with the ambiguity of missing evidence or conflicting interpretations, these and so many more social studies skills. Let's go back now and bring in additional information. You can see some of it here. The date, 1486, the artist, country, location of the painting now, Tokyo National Museum. This artist, Sashitoyo, is regarded as one of Japan's greatest. He was born in 1420, almost 600 years ago, and he lived during the period in Japanese history called the Ashikaga Shogunate, because political power was held by shoguns, military rulers, from the Ashikaga clan. Japan also had emperors who were politically and religiously important, but did not directly rule the country. The Ashikaga Shogunate is also referred to as the Muromachi period, named for the area in the capital, capital city of Kyoto, where the shoguns lived. Seshu was born into a samurai family that sent him to a Zen Buddhist monastery when he was 11. That was the best place to get an education in that era. According to legend, the form of Buddhism called Zen in Japan, Chan in China, was brought from India by a priest named Bodhidharma. Seshu's training to become a priest was rigorous, and he supposedly wasn't a very good student because he preferred to spend his time drawing and painting. He made his way to Kyoto when he was around 20 and lived as a priest in one of the most important Zen temples there at a time when Zen Buddhism was favored by the shoguns. He studied painting with the famous master and became increasingly well-known himself. Although the Ashikaga shoguns had gained their power militarily, they gathered artworks both for their own enjoyment and also to dazzle others with a collection that surpassed that of the emperor. It was a way to show their power and gain prestige. Art's often been used in that way. The shoguns particularly valued Chinese paintings that had been painted hundreds of years earlier during the Song Dynasty. Song paintings continued to be regarded in both China and Japan as models worth emulating. Seshu, living in Kyoto as a resident of a temple with close ties to the shoguns, saw some of these paintings. He became adept at painting in the styles of various Chinese artists as he developed his own style. In the self-portrait, he paints himself wearing a type of hat worn by Chinese scholars and priests. In 1449, Ashikaga Yoshimas became shogun. He wasn't particularly interested in governing. He far preferred to enjoy art, build temples, residences, and gardens, and participate in tea ceremonies. This is a picture of a part of the palace he built in Kyoto called the Silver Pavilion, spending vast sums while ignoring his responsibilities as shogun. In 1464, the Onan War broke out around him, a civil war that destroyed much of the city of Kyoto. Seshu left the capital for the provinces, as did many others. A side effect of all these people fleeing Kyoto was the spread throughout Japan of various arts that until then had been unique to Kyoto. Here's a map of some of the places Seshu traveled with Kyoto there on the right, uh, sort of in central Japan. Ultimately, Seshu traveled to the west of Japan and then was able to join a trading mission that went from there to China, to initially to the city of Ningbo, there lower on your map. From there, he traveled to Beijing, which had become the Ming Dynasty capital in 1420, the same year that Seshu was born. While in China, he studied painting and Zen Buddhist texts. And then when he returned to Japan, he stayed, for the most part, far away from the capital, first on the island of Kyushu and later in other locations. Despite the turmoil in the country, he led a long and productive life, dying in 1506 
at the age of 86. Think of that self-portrait. That Chinese hat indicates the importance he placed on his experiences in China, and he incorporated references to his travels into his signature and into inscriptions that were often attached to paintings. When we return to for this 1486 painting by Sessu, knowing this context, we see it somewhat differently. He was 66 years old when he painted it, and he'd been a priest and an artist all his life. He lived mostly in cities and towns. So this is probably an imagined view following the Chinese models established 300 or even more years earlier. He probably painted this while inside a temple or monastery for viewing by other monks. It was not monumental. In fact, it was really quite small and was made to be seen close up. It alluded to meditation and to Buddhist teachings about nature and our place in it. Think of that little person there, lost in nature. So looking back at it, Seshu's life story took place against a backdrop of major themes that are often studied in world history. Political struggles between rival individuals and systems and between centralized authority and regional powers. That was going on all around him. Cultural influences transmitted from one country to another, often carried by trade or diplomatic relations. He personally participated in that. The transmission of religion and culture together. In this example, Zen Buddhism, which had come much earlier from China to Japan, along with related art forms, and then flour flourished in Japan. The era when the Ashikaga shoguns ruled Japan is remembered now, despite the political failures of Ashikaga Yoshimas, as a period when many arts that continued to be a part of Japanese culture were established and flourished. Seshu lived during a time of political turmoil, but also a time of major artistic developments that have influenced Japanese culture ever since. To learn more, one good reference source for you and your students is the Heilbrunn Timeline of Art History at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Here's a screenshot of one of the pages. You can find short essays and images in addition to the timeline. All those images across the top can be expanded. This screenshot is one of the pages about the Muromachi period. Remember another name for the Ashikaga Shogunate. One way to situate Seshu in Japanese culture and history is by considering the system of national treasures. This screenshot shows you an excerpt of part of a list of those national treasures. For over a century now, the Japanese government has maintained a list of what it regards as the best artworks in Japan. Down there at the lower right, you can see just part of the artwork we've been looking at, and just above it, the companion piece that was an ottoman landscape. In the painting category, there are 159 paintings considered to be national treasures. Of those, 20 are Song Dynasty Chinese paintings, showing how important these paintings were and still are. And of the 159 paintings, six are by Seshu Toyo, a remarkable number for one artist in a system that spans more than a thousand years of paintings. In the category of buildings, one of the national treasures is the Silver Pavilion, which I showed you earlier where Ashikaga Yoshimas ignored the civil war raging around him. Seshu's artistic contributions to Japanese culture are an important part of the le legacy of the Muromachi period, when the Ashikaga shoguns supported Zen Buddhism, commissioned and collected art, built beautiful buildings. Ideas that grew from Zen Buddhist teachings, such as valuing simplicity and imperfection, 
the concept that less is more, live on in painting styles and in other arts too, such as flower arranging and tea ceremony. You can't learn all this just by looking at a painting and asking a few questions. But those questions we looked at earlier can start your students on a path to looking at images more deeply, thinking analytically about what they see, and discussing different inferences and interpretations. Nowadays, our world's so full of powerful images competing for our attention. I think it's kind of sad that in our textbooks, if you even have textbooks and if they have pictures, the pictures just sit there squashed alongside a column of text. If you can make any of those pictures come alive for your students, you're teaching social studies skills while opening doors to understanding and appreciating a different place and time in history. If you want to follow up on these ideas, you can copy down this link it will take you to the list of terms, the questions and resources mentioned in this talk, and a few other resources. Thank you for watching this. I hope you and your students will enjoy exploring Japanese art. When I was a high school student, I had a social studies teacher who introduced us to Japanese art. I have no memory of what methods she used, but I do know that she enriched and ultimately changed my life. Thanks again.